Apparently, you drank like 100 beers from a cross-country trip. 73. Hold on. So what is the story? Yo, Philly. We're coming with the Tops Off World Tour November 29th, and I'm bringing DJ Jazzy Jeff to Philadelphia, then Norfolk, Winston-Salem, Fairfax, Roanoke, Rochester, Worcester, Newark, Providence, and Albany, New York, December 10th. You realize this is like a this is like a childhood dream come true right now. Thanks. You are, and I say child probably when you were playing in the pros when we were all in probably high school. I'm guessing. Yep, you were a uh, Jesuit. Yeah, I was a Jesuit. Right. And you were. There's a handful of legends that come out of Tampa. Thank you. I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm wondering if you. Uh, you okay? I got positively roasted over the street. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That was great. Uh, um and it, and it's and it's crazy. It's it's just insane to me. Like my this is my first question and this is like such a Tampa question. Where when you were a kid, where did you get your baseball gear? Like your bat, your gloves, your bats? Like Florida Sporting Goods. Florida Sporting Goods. On Florida Avenue. On Florida Avenue. Yeah. Really? I'm the only I I was one of the only kids that uh, never used aluminum bat. So I would go down there and pick wooden bats out. So my my visionary of pr- playing professional baseball, yeah. I never used aluminum bat in high school. Really, I used a wooden bat, and I would go down there and pick pick bats out. And Pete Rose was the model that I would pick all the time. Oh, and yeah. yeah, I had, uh, and it would break. I'd put a couple nails in it or something <laughs> and keep it going. And and uh, but it's it's. It, it was one of those things because I didn't want to get used to an aluminum yeah. and then have to get used to a wooden bat when I signed professionally. Really? So I used a wooden bat all my life. And, and my average would have been probably 50, 60 points higher had I, I used an aluminum I, I'm bat. I'm imagining it would have been. But I still hit 485 with a wooden bat in high school. So. Good <laughs> God. That's insane. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh-huh. so where did you grow up playing? Were you did you grow up in Davis South Davis Island? Davis Island? I was an island rat. Are you serious? Yeah. Man, these 1970 are like- was the first year of Bayshore Little League. And that was my inaugural year in Bayshore because I just moved from Georgia. Yeah. And uh so I'm on the island and it was old Ed Wright over here in Swan. Yeah. Was the old uh Ed Wright Little League. Uh-huh. Well, they moved that little league because they were selling it for the inter- for the uh, expressway, so they moved all of that they were to Bayshore. The expressway. <laughs> and we had one field at Bayshore, and yeah. and all the games were scattered throughout the thing. I mean, now once I went to Palmacia, Palmacia had four senior league fields and one big league field and a whole bunch of little league fields and all yeah. that. But Bayshore had one one field, yeah, and that's that's. Where it all started. That's those are like the craziest, like because you, as a kid, you'd hear stories about you playing a plant, and you could, you could envision maybe a little bit of that part, but never the little stuff. Like I played out of Forest Hills, I played out of Forest Hills in North Tampa. I remember Dwight Gooden. Uh, oh yeah, when Floyd I was, Yeomans and Dwight Gooden, and I remember Dwight Gooden came mm-hmm. out when he was like nineteen years old in a Corvette and had his dinner on the hood of his Corvette as we were all practicing. And our dads were like, yo, Dwight Gooden's out at the parking lot. And you're like, shut up. As adults now, you're like, "That's a, I guess it is crazy to be 19 playing in the professional. <laughs> like, what do you do with your free time? Yeah, just sit on the hood of my car. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, and so then you you went, played at plant. I would love to, I would love to, because there's obviously high points I want to talk about, but I, I would love to just track out your career because I think I, there's things that, glare to me that i go that stand out where i like some things are thorns in my side that have happened in your career where i go eh, i feel like management could have done that differently and then there's things that i remember distinctly like i i want to talk to you definitely about uh about the getting on the horse because i remember that i remember that so vividly i remember that so vividly and there was a dude who there was a, a comic i will but we'll talk about that in a second um, but I kind of want to track out. So you p- then played at plant. How would were you always the kid when you played that every all the dads everyone was like he's just spectacular. I was the f- first draft choice in the draft in uh, Bayshore Little League. 
Really? Yeah. Because I just moved from Georgia mm -hmm. and I was, I had started playing Little League when I was five and it wasn't coach pitch. It wasn't T-ball. We had 12 year olds pitching to five year olds. Wow. That's how old Little League used to be. Yeah. And you could play at five if, if you made the cut. And at five, I made the cut. So I played against all of these older kids, which made me a lot better, a lot faster. And so I was the number one draft choice for the Buick Wildcats on on <laughs> on Bayshore Lake. Hang on, which let's, is let's, a, your son's over in the corner. I want to go. <laughs> that's merch I'd buy right now. Just I'm just giving you a heads up. If you give me a wave box, Buick, Buick Wildcat jersey, I'll buy that right now. It can just be a T-shirt. Get me a fitted cap. That's merch I'll buy right now. Oh, I wish I had it. I'm oh, telling God, you, those were the days. There's well, there's so well, much. I got a bubblegum card of it. My uh, sister-in-law took a picture of me in the front room of, of my house in my little league uniform and, and somehow tops or Don Russ or something turned it into a bubblegum card. Really? Yeah. So it's a picture of me when I was 12 years old in my wildcat uniform, but it's a bubblegum card now. So, so you're drafted first. Did you have, do you, and looking back and I only say this because there's so many podcasts out right now where you hear people talk about greatness and and how they achieve it and how they get there and 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 their inspiration and the way their brain works and the and and I think you truly lived in a place in a time when when that wasn't the folk like the focus was almost like talent over over like P Rose was a hard worker but like I'm curious to like as a kid what your motivation was how driven you were were you obsessed with baseball was it something that you just loved like I'm curious of that. My dad started throwing me balls in Puerto Rico when I was 18 months old. And Joe Gargiola and Tony Kubek showed it to Ted Williams on Game of the Week. Yeah. And said, do you know who this is? And he says, no, but he's got a hell of a swing. <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> so, Shut up. And, and that was 18 months. So then how that progressed. God, your dad's a legend. And so going through Senior League and Palmasia and all of that, there were – uh, Steve Garvey and Tony Larusa, yeah, were the other two from Tampa T that Steve went Gar on. I met Steve Garvey one time. I had met a mom who had dated Steve Garvey in high school. And Lou Pinella. And Lou Pinella. So those three are the ones that came out of Tampa. Yeah, okay? Lou Pinella. Jefferson and God. Chamberlain yeah. and all of that. So those were the baseball. But we had so many baseball greats that came out of West Tampa and and – like you said, Forest Hills. Some, I yeah. mean, oh my gosh, they did go to the Little League World Series, and and just the the hotbed that this Tampa Bay area has of great players that come out to play professionally. Yeah, is I'll compare it to Texas, California, anywhere you want to compare it. This area with with an eighteen mile radius will blow any any state away. Especially now, when you look at these kids training the way they train. Oh, it's, 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 it's insane. It's, it's so far. I have a buddy whose son's going to pitch at Vanderbilt or he's probably pitching right now at Vanderbilt. And I, I, I saw him on his Instagram. He's in physical training every morning before school like that. We didn't have that. So in, uh, my sophomore year in high school at plant, we were on double sessions. So the junior seniors went in the morning and the sophomores went in the afternoon. Well, in order for me to make the baseball team, they had to switch all my schedule around. And I went with all the juniors and seniors because I made the, ba there were only three guys that made the uh, three sophomores yeah. that made the baseball team my sophomore year. Um, Harry Lynn, Wilford Ramos and myself. So we went in the morning. I, I never went to school with my class because they went in the afternoon. Yeah. So I had, and then my junior year, we were still in double sessions. And my senior year, it was all one. So I got to I got to enjoy my senior year with with eight to two thirty or whatever. So, yeah. but uh, I made the team my sophomore year as a knuckleball pitcher really? and a backup shortstop <laughs> to Billy Dow. Yeah. How, how big were you uh, sophomore year? How tall? Uh, six two, one hundred and sixty five, hundred seventy pounds. Okay. I was skinny. No, but I mean, I, was, I would. I would love to be 160. I was, <laughs> yeah. I'd pay top dollar for that right now. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so but you, you it, lost a lot. How much have you lost? I lost uh, about 30 pounds right now. I'm just good been, for I'm, you. Well, I, I, 
it's the it's the obvious ones where you go like I, I haven't been drinking and i've been eating keto and i've been working out and i'm on testosterone that's a that's a big game changer speeds I mean, up the metabolism. what do you think about what do you think about when you saw all these guys on steroids during the steroid era what did you think if that was available to you back in the day what would you think it was available to me oh, it was yeah really yeah really yeah i said no yeah it was available to me and hgh Really? HGH was available to me too. Wow. But I had one pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. Hall of Fame. And I knew if I did something illegal and got caught, that that would prohibit my chances of ever possibly making the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And coincidentally, that the guys that have gotten popped don't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. So there you go. Yeah. I never, uh, I think people think of so. I mean, it's so- a double edged sword. I mean, you want to be great? These guys are already great. I mean, there's only so much levels of greatness after you're great that yeah. understandably you're going to, when A-Rod did it, he did it for $250 million and then he did it again to make 250 more. So, okay, he's made $500 million, but he's not at, What's his legacy? In, in, the, in the Holy Grail and he didn't plag his, uh, plant his flag. In the uh, in the mountain of greatness. Yeah. It's interesting. They allow a lot. They allow a lot. And then they've got a couple rules. We're like, yo, no PEDs, no gambling. And I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's interesting because I think people think, well, to get there. But once you're there, why, why the fuck are you doing? You're already great. The, you're right. the thing that, that I took from, from steroids and and that type of thing everybody called them performance enhancing drugs Mm -hmm. i called them play everyday drugs peds that performance enhancing no it's play every day because you get to the end of uh, uh, end of august the beginning of september Mm -hmm. you're beat you're playing every day playing every day you you're you're travel you're back and forth back and forth back and forth and you're sitting there by the end of the by the end of august you're going God, just get me through September and hope you know we make the playoffs, and then I'll get that uh, that shot rejuvenation of of oh my gosh, here we go, we're in the playoffs kind of thing. Yeah, these guys sticking needles in their rear end are the ones that run through brick walls in September, and that's why they're outperforming all of the guys that are beaten up. Yeah, and they're still producing at a high level, and the guys are coming out of the games in the fourth inning that aren't doing it. And the guys are pitching into the eighth inning that are doing it. Yeah. So they're, they're extending the recovery time. They're extending their, their performance level and boom, here you go. I mean, they're posting every fifth day, you know, for the pitchers and for the players, they're posting every day and they don't need a day up because like I said, they, when you, when you do it, you could run through a brick wall. Yeah, that is the, you know, the recovery is insane. Yeah. Like I used to lift weights and like be sore. I have not been sore once. And I, I it's crazy, but you go, well, I'm ready to go back in. Mm-hmm. And I'm just a regular person, not really pushing myself to limits. I can't imagine what the schedule is like. I had a buddy, I won't speak for him on behalf of him, but I, but I, I'm paraphrasing uh, a buddy, Brad Radke, he pitched for the Twins. I faced him. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I faced him when he was at a the home Twins run back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> back to back triples. <laughs> <laughs> Clip that out. Send that to Radke. <laughs> yeah. So, and it, uh, he came and played. He came and uh, played in in New York and was probably when you were at New York. Okay. And was uh, exhausted. And I remember him saying, "This schedule is like I don't know how much longer I can last." And he was still young at the time. And he was like, and I think I think that was one of the big things in him, re, him retiring was the schedule is just. I think crazy. he only had like eight or ten. Yeah, if that. I mean, yeah. but I mean, he was really good for that period of time. And he was their number one. So I mean, but I mean, guys, they just get it. It wears you down. It really does. And, but you got to be mentally tough as well. I mean, you just can't sit there and take like two or three days off and say, okay, I'll be back in. I mean, we're all not Cal Ripken, you know, playing every day, but I prided myself on playing 155 out of 162, 158, 158, 157, right around in there, maybe having four or five days off 
throughout the course of the whole year. Yeah. Every 21 days, you get an automatic day off. But normally, that's travel. So you're going from the East Coast to the West Coast. You're going from te- uh, uh, New York to Texas. Yeah. Or... Or what have you. So the schedule looks like for the average person that's listening that's like a MMA fan, the schedule is every single fucking day, practically. Well, you are you have seven-game homestand, 10-game ten ga- uh, road trip. You come back for 10, you're gone for seven. You come back for uh, an eight-game homestand, you're gone for 12 days. Jeez. And, well, that's the thing when you have children yeah. that – you miss their first words, you miss their first steps and all of this. And these are the things that you love about grandchildren now that you can sit there and <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait for grandchildren. <laughs> the touring schedule is like that. We're out for 13. Like we'll go. We used to go uh, out for three weeks, home for a week, out for three weeks, home for a week. And when I was at Travel Channel, it was two weeks out, one week on the road, two weeks out, one week on the road. I never was home. But I always, I always defended it by i'm providing for my family sure and if i didn't do this i don't know what i'd be doing and i don't know like hey you think i'm i'm rough to be around now imagine (laughs) if i'm working at home depot i might not be the most pleasant dude (laughs) there you go (laughs) but and i always and i always said i always said because people other comics would say how do you do it and i go you know there's guys that have it worse than me and when you look at an entire baseball season that must be like I bet it's I bet it's fucking awesome though. I bet well, at the beginning of the year you get what, fucking. What you pumped. do is is <clears throat> how I would do it. I would use January first as my starting point. January second, I started hitting before spring training. I would mm-hmm. report to spring training possibly on February tenth. So I'd have a month to prepare, hit. Actually, I hit over Jesuit quite a bit. Uh, we, used to, we used to have we used to have uh, that we'd have people come pros come out. Uh, Dave Magadan and Fred McGriff would right. come out when I played, okay. and and you and it was the the speed of the bat is so different than us in in high school. It was so impressive to watch. Oh yeah, and the, how far they go. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I remember just the crack. Yeah, I'm hitting was, balls on the football field. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was like. These guys are watching me, you know, they're playing at Jesuit yeah. and all that, and they're watching me, and I'm hitting balls over the conse- uh, the uh, the press box of the football stadium. Yeah. And uh, they go, oh, my God, wow. <laughs> and then I, I wound up going to UT quite a bit. Uh, but um, so I'd, start, use, yeah. I'd use that as my, my beginning, get to spring training. You play 35 games in spring training. I wasn't the kind of guy that took a week off after spring training started like they do nowadays and spring training's going on and these guys aren't playing and I'm going, how, how, how do they, and I don't know how they do this. Yeah. And a majority of them, a lot of them don't work out or hit in the off season until they get to spring training. So very first game in spring training, I played, I played 35 one year in Boston when I was with Boston and winter Haven, I think I had 125 at bats in spring training. At 125 wow. at bats in spring training, then during the regular season, I had 751 plate appearances. <laughs> Holy cow! So you play 35, 162, and then your playoffs start. So if you go all the way and win a World Series, you have an opportunity to play 219 games in one year. Wow! And that will beat you to death i bet it that would. will beat you to death and I, I wanted to hit the ground running when i came out of spring training i didn't i didn't want any lulls or anything like this because when you come out of spring training you're in you're in 92 94 degree weather in winter haven and your ears look like you have leprosy and they're gonna fall <laughs> off and everything yeah. and, and then you go open up in boston or detroit and you're sitting there going this is brutally cold and so your first month of the season traveling from Detroit to uh, New York, Boston, and and Chicago, various cities like that, it's freezing. Yeah. And you just want to hold your head above water during that first month of the season. If you're hitting over 300 after the first month of the season, you have a great year. Really? Oh, yeah. That's how tough the, the, the cold is because uh, it's, just, it's just miserable. Miserable. Uh, it's funny you come down to spring season and you were home this is where you grew up and then you'd go back up 
and to all these cold weather places. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then the day after the season's over, I just come back to Tampa. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. I never lived in the cities. We in New York when I was there for five years, we rented a, a house, mm -hmm. so we didn't really have anything. And my last four years in Boston, we bought a um, a townhouse. But other than that, when I came back home to play for the Rays, it was like sleep in your own bed, drive your own car, all those good things. Have your son as the bat boy. So it's like, okay. Have your son as the bat boy is probably the best. I can't imagine living in the city I live in. Like like people go, so where do you live? And I, I say LA, but I, I mean, I'm not there. I've maybe, I've slept in my tour. I've slept in the tour bus way more than my regular bed. People go, I do a read for, uh, for uh, mattresses and uh, it's the mattress we have at home. And it's such a tr treat to sleep in it because it's such a great mattress. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have just upgraded my mattress to my tour bus. So like now I got, <laughs> but like I only now it feels like yeah, home. Yeah. Now it feels like <laughs> home. You sound like a, like a numbers guy. Were you, were you, did you, were you aware of your batting average as you were, as you were playing? This show is sponsored by better help this time of year. Uh, it can be a lot. And it's natural to feel a little bit of sadness or anxiety about it. The weather's changing. It gets dark early. Family's coming in town. There's a lot going on. I'll tell you this. Adding something new and possibly positive to your life can counteract with some of those feelings you're having. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change this season. Something to look forward to to make you feel grounded and to give you the tools you need to manage everything going on. And there is a lot going on. Let's just think about travel in general. For me, travel gives me so much anxiety. It's nice to have someone to talk about that anxiety with and my parents. I'll tell you a secret. Uh, I'm always concerned about what my dad's going to say about my weight loss <laughs> or if I'm overweight or how I'm eating or how I'm drinking at Thanksgiving. There's so much going on, and I love to sit and talk to my therapist about it and get ready and prepared to have the tools to deal with all that before Thanksgiving or, or the holidays start. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Bert today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bert. We are supported by Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million dollars in orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soaps or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, whenever, wherever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn your browser into Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Let me tell you something. This is all we use. This is all we've been using. And I will tell you this, Leanne loves to brag about our growth. She does it every night when we go in bed. You know what we did in e-commerce today? Uh, it, it's a no-brainer, especially if you're if you have a business. Sign up. For a $1 per month trial period at Shopify.com slash BirdCast, all lowercase. Go to Shopify.com slash BirdCast now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash BirdCast. Were you aware of numbers during the game, during the season? I didn't really have to calculate. I, I just worried on what happened that day. Yeah. And I knew, I knew if, if, if I walked a couple times, I got on base a couple of times. And my job as a leadoff hitter is to score runs. Mm -hmm. I was a table setter for Jim Rice and, and all the guys coming up behind me and Dwight Evans and all of those guys and setting the table and scoring runs. I mean, I enjoyed scoring 100 runs a year. And, I mean, that was my job. 
Yeah. And kind of coincidental that uh, I think it was 1987, 85 or 87, that um, Ricky Henderson and myself each scored 135 runs. I had two stolen bases, and he had 101. So it was like, okay, let's let's do the math there. He steals yeah. bases and scores the same as Boggs? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something's, something's going on here. That's crazy. So what was it like? What was it like? Like in your senior year of, of high school, was it? I mean, this is a very shallow question, but were you like the man? Like everyone knew where well, you, what was happening with you. Well, the thing about it was 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 uh, Billy Dow, the senior shortstop, when I was a sophomore, he graduated. So now I was a shortstop. Yeah. So my junior year, I went to make an all state, and hit four twenty five that year, eight home runs, and and yes. and. And we went to the state playoffs that year and wound up getting beat by uh, Coral City uh, over in uh, um, Orlando. I, I, can I tell you what impresses me is I remember our losses and I remember our I remember our stuff just as much as you do. But it's it's nice to know that it those memories are as important to you as they are to me as opposed to as, to, as they are to everyone that played high school ball. Like the, I remember the kid who's – position i took in left field i remember the catcher yeah. oh, I, I remember i remember all the names as well right but i think a lot of people look at someone like you who has had such a le- legit hall of fame career and go there's no way he remembers the shortstop who he replaced and of course you do right and that's the like i mean i don't know i mean it's i, I bet there's i bet there's dicks out there that are like i don't know his fucking name but <laughs> that's what i love about you well, thanks i appreciate that so then we basically, my senior year had everybody coming back. So it was going to be one of those no brainers. Yeah. And our very first game against Jefferson in the playoffs, they wound up beating us. And Pop Cuesta, who was Pop the, yeah. Cuesta. You knew Pop so, Cuesta. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pop Cuesta yeah. was uh, the post 148. Was oh, yeah. It was yeah. Legion Ball. So, so I was. <laughs> this I was, is such a Tampa podcast right uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like so in the weeds uh, for uh, Ebor City. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and Macaloosa at King and, yeah. and everybody. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. And uh, Pete Mulry and, oh, yeah, I can, I can go on and on, but. But um, yeah, we were we were supposed to like breeze through all the all the playoffs, go to state, and uh, we wound up losing three two, and I had first and second and popped up uh, my last at bat in high school, and it was it was so disheartening and just to know that we had an opportunity to be the best in the state, and I let everybody down, and I sort of antiquate that to the fact that Yastrzemski in the playoff game in 78 yeah when he popped up to the infield to end the uh the one game playoff that yeah. they had against the Yankees it sort of made me feel like Carl Yastrzemski when when he did the same thing <laughs> yeah but um yeah I've, I've always every time I'd see pop I and he goes yeah yeah, you popped up against me to end the season. And I went, okay, Pop, I remember it just as much as you do. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My last at bat, it's so funny you say your last at bat. I remember my last at bat in high school baseball against Plant. It was for district championships. And I had I had such a, I had been, my especially my senior year because, uh, you know, I, I didn't know where I wanted to go with baseball, but I was so um, almost... I couldn't enjoy the moment. I had a ritual of getting in the box. I couldn't enjoy it. That the last time I got up at bat, I realized this is possibly the last time I'll ever be in a game of baseball. I didn't know if I was going to go play at Florida State or not. And I had never enjoyed, I've never been more confident in the batter's box, and I never enjoyed it more. And I walked away saying, where was that the entire time I played? Right. Like, And I said, I, th- I thought to myself, because as I went to go to – I had a lot of conversation with my dad about what I was going to do. And when I went to play at Florida state, I was like, I don't think this, is, I don't think baseball's my thing. Like, I don't think for whatever reason, that last time about, I was so fucking confident and I crushed the ball down left field f- fence uh, for a double. And, and it, it was fruitless. We lost. Uh, 
Shout out to a line Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I mean, I can remember so many fucking names. I know. But uh, but yeah, my dad had always said to me with Radke growing up playing with Radke, my dad was like, you know, I would say like, how come people, uh, how come people don't talk to me about me the way they talk about Brad? And my dad's like, oh, it's just different with him, buddy. He was like, and my dad's a very like probably maybe too much of an honest dude. He said, you know. He just well, he was a, a Jedi Knight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is that does play into it. But he was like, he was like, the whole point in life is to find your thing. Like Brad found baseball. Sure, find whatever you're really great right. at and just love it and excel at it. And he goes, look, you know, he goes, if you play baseball, you're going to be the guy that has to bust his ass and work extra hard to do it. Brad just can do it, right? And so when I started comedy, I remember calling my dad and, and I correlated it to baseball. I said, Dad, I found my the thing that Radke had for baseball, I found it. It's comedy. Like mm-hmm. I just, it's it. I, I wouldn't say it's effortless to me, but I, I the same way I got it that, that last at bat, sure. very confident. I feel that every time I go on stage, I love being in that situation. Well, the thing about it is, is if you'd have gone the baseball route, you'd have been the funniest guy in the locker room. I would have fucking murdered. So. And by the way, I would never so, have had to change and go woke at all. <laughs> I could say whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> I mean, it, it's we all have them. You know, we all have the funny dude in the in the clubhouse, and and you know, the cracks jokes, does practical yeah. jokes, and and everything like that. But but um, well, that was the thing after after that last at bat, and and I'm done with high school. I'm still playing Legion ball. So the next thing on the radar is the draft that's coming up, and that was coming up on June 10th that year in 1976. So it was whether or not I was going to get drafted in the first couple rounds or go to the university of South Carolina and play for Bobby Richardson and be a Gamecock. And, uh, so I went down to the Tribune building and they had back then they had the teletype come across and it was sort of the running tape and, and the drafts coming in and Sammy Spence who played in Brandon, uh, we went down and they're taking a pic pictures of me and him because we were supposed to go either one, two or, first round and then second round or something like this. Well, Sammy Spence wound up going in the, in the third round to, um, to Cleveland, I believe. And, uh, so I stayed till the fourth round. Well, I had a game that afternoon and I had to leave. Yeah. So we're playing at Al Lopez field. And at the time, my, my girlfriend, now my wife, Debbie, so she came running down and my dad's right behind her. She came running down, said seventh round, Boston, seventh round, Boston. So I quit taking ground balls, go over, give her a hug like this. And here comes my dad down and, and gives me a big hug and all of this. And, and, and said, son, Fenway park was built for you. Oh, wow. And this was before I'd even gone five and a half years in the minor leagues or even played in Fenway park or anything. He said, Fenway park was built for you. And fast forward to ending of my career and everything like this. There's one guy who's in second place at 363 in Fenway Park, average-wise. His name's Ted Williams. And the guy that's in front of him was at 368, and that's me. (laughs) So no truer words were spoken than my dad saying, Fenway Park was built for you. Wow. What was your, what was your, God, that is, that is, uh. I said, I that really, it's like almost seeing it from 3,000 feet up right there. You're like, no shit. Yeah. It's what was your special. What was your dad like? Uh, military guy. Yeah. Yeah. He spent his 16th birthday in Guadalcanal. He was a sophomore in high school. For, forced his birth certificate. Spent his 16th birthday in Guadalcanal. Um, Where was he from? Nebraska? No, Georgia. Georgia. Oh, Georgia, for real? Atlanta. Yeah, he's from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow, so he's oh. from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, um was a Marine for five years and then enlisted in the, uh, air force retired master sergeant, but I grew up military family. And that's sort of where all the, the idiosyncrasies that, that I, uh, the superstitions that came from are all are number wise yeah. because you had to, uh, dinner was at five 30. Mm-hmm. And if you showed up at five 35, it was in the trash. You know, you get up at the same time, brush your teeth, you're ready for school and all of this. And, and the buses at the same time and this. And this. So everything's regimented yeah. and sort of military wise. 
and growing up with the with the crew cuts and and everything like this and then i rebelled when i got to high school and had the long hair so <laughs> that was one of them was but, your dad out at mcdill no he was uh he was in uh hunter air force base uh when we lived in in georgia yeah out of savannah um, he was at Offutt in Nebraska. That's where I was born. Yeah. He spent uh, three years in Ramey in, in Puerto Rico. So, yeah, he was in SAC, Strategic Air Command. But uh, baseball-wise, he was brilliant. Really? Yeah. He was, he, he, he was the all-world fast-pitch softball player in the Air Force. He beat wow. Eddie Fainer twice. Wow. So, without saying something. Yeah. So, he was all-world and and – he just had this knowledge of hitting that was was Charlie Lau before Charlie Lau. It's called the weight weight theory, uh, W E I G H T and W A I T. So it's shift your weight, weight on the ball, and that enabled me to hit the ball to left field. Consequently, Fenway Park was built for me because he yeah. taught me. Oh how, wow, that's right. He yeah. taught me how to hit the ball to left fuck, field. Fuck, fuck. So that's great. Yeah. So he yeah. engineered this whole process of Fenway Park uh, was built for you is right yeah. and uh and originally starting out throwing left-handed so made me throw right-handed so I could play more positions so oh my god I so love basically this guy. I was in, I love this guy so basically I'm amphibious that I yeah. can throw with either hand so I taught my daughters their swing I had I I uh You've seen my swing. You commented on my swing. I, I'll just say right. simply is maybe one of the greatest moments of my entire <laughs> life. And I had just played the Emily Arena. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, I taught my daughters their swings. I, my daughters had beautiful swings. And then they went in to play, uh, l- play softball. And a coach who I think was working off some uh, community service hours, not the best coach in the world, changed my daughter Isla's swing or daughter Georgia's swing and then ruined it and ruined it. It broke my heart and I would have to smoke. I would have to hit a vape pen in the outfield. I was so bothered. (laughs) My daughter Isla, who walked away from softball, the same coach tried to change her swing. And so she started hitting left-handed. Wow. (laughs) And I had taught her. She was just, she's a weird kid. And I would, I would pitch to them in the front yard and, uh, God, Georgia had the prettiest, the longest swing. Like, and I'm and I'm saying, obviously, it's my child, but it a right-handed Daryl Strawberry swing. Wow. I mean, just a, it was so beautiful. Mm-hmm. It was the longest swing. I, and I, 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 that's all I remember thinking about it. And I love well, that's tough in softball. Uh, yeah, to have a long swing. Oh, it was. Well, sadly, I didn't. I didn't really care much about softball. I was playing baseball with them. <laughs> I didn't give go. a shit about softball. I was go. like, come on, ladies. Yeah. But uh but yeah, it's uh God, that's prophetic words coming out of your dad's mouth. And yeah. and how when did he pass? Uh two thousand nine. Oh wow. So he got to see all of it. Yeah, he, he got to he got to be at the Hall of Fame and and God you know, that that's some of the 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 difficult what well, my mom was was killed by the drunk driver in '86. Sadly, and I didn't want to and, bring this up, but I, I was I remember the day your mother passed. Yeah, we were playing baseball. I think. Yeah, June seventeenth. Yeah, we were playing. We were on a baseball field, and, and a, she was hit by a, a car. Correct. The driver. It was a, a driver. Right. It was a rock hauler. Yeah, rock hauler. A rock hauler that was supposed to be in Lakeland. Yeah. And he was drunk, and the road it was raining, and she was right where the jail used to be, where. Mm. 275 and I four come on and everything. He was coming off. He was coming off of I four coming into downtown and she was the opposite car. And the one car saw it stopped and she pulled out. And uh, yeah, I remember. we were in New York and my act coincidentally, my dad was in New York also. So we had to fly home, uh, that afternoon and her birthday was June 18th. So I had to buy her a casket for her birthday. So that was the, the, the horrible part of 86 that, that, and, and really my sanctity and, and how I got through 86 was using the white lines Mm -hmm. as my area to go to. Once I crossed the white lines. I thought you were talking about cocaine. I was like, no, 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 we've been there. We've been there. (laughs) But once, once I crossed the white lines, I, every, everything was quiet. Yeah. And I didn't have to think about anything, but just going out there and playing baseball and doing all of that. And the iconic photo of me in the dugout after the Mets clinch of me crying and all of that. And I'm the one that everybody's focused on. 
uh, partly to do with losing the World Series, um, my first World Series that I, I, I had gotten to, but um, losing the World Series and knowing that, that I have to go back home and walk through that door and my mom's not going to be there. Yeah. And it was just, it was very difficult. And, you know, at the time I had to make sure that dad didn't fall apart and everything like that. So, um, so then in 96, he was, he was part of that regalia of, of, and he was in there and I was pouring champagne over his head in the clubhouse. And, and, uh, so he, he got to experience both, both ends of the spectrum with, with losing one and winning one. And, and yeah, he, uh, the hall of fame was just the, the planting that flag in that mountain and knowing that, uh, okay, wow. Oh, your son did it. Okay, yeah. great. Because so many guys now that get into the hall of fame, their parents have passed and, and various things like that. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because they, they raise you, they want to, you know, see all the great things that you've ever done. And then the, the greatest day of your life is they're not there, but my dad was, and he had such a, a wonderful time. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a testament to how much of Tampa you are in that. I remember where I was when your mom passed. Wow. It's, I mean, I, I just, it's, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Wow, no, no, it was that. Well, cause you, you were, it was a horrible day. You were our guy. I mean, you, 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 you know, as 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 well as like the Pinellas always seemed Tampa friend like they were always in Tampa right but you were our guy I remember I remember uh, hearing things uh, I remember one time it was either a USF baseball game or a plant baseball game but you would come by the field and everyone was like Wade Box is here Wade Box is here it was like a big it was a you know it's uh this sounds whatever it's gonna sound like but as a kid I. It, celebrity and the and the kindness of celebrities was uh mattered to me it 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 was like it you know that you'd meet leroy selman or or jimmy giles uh jimmy giles or 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 batman woods and you'd meet them and they'd be nice men Mm -hmm. it was such a like wow right and then you and then you'd have a moment in the car with your dad going like he's a regular guy isn't that great isn't that great like and then to think they don't need to be that, but they are, and and you were that consistently through our all of our lives, and so I, it's always nice to know. I said Steve Garvey. I met Steve Garvey. <laughs> this is the dumbest story in the world. Uh, Steve Garvey apparently had said maybe he dated uh, a, a guy I played baseball, his mom, and I and I'm so I'm an adult. I'm like forty, maybe I'm forty seven. I don't even know, but I'm doing. Good Day LA, and Steve Garvey's in there. And so I'm like, I'm going to introduce myself to Steve Garvey. He's a Tampa guy. So I come in and I said, uh, Mr. Garvey, I just <laughs> I want to tell you I, I'm from Tampa, this and that. I'm a big fan. I'm, uh, you dated one of my friend's moms. And he said, in high school, he said, well, really? And I said, yeah. And I said her name. He goes, oh, I, don't, I don't think I did. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you did. Well, that was the story we got. It could be different. And he goes, are you sure it wasn't Steve Harvey? And I said, well, Mr. Garvey, that really changes the story. <laughs> if she dated Steve Harvey. Yeah. That <laughs> really changes it. It's a different story. <laughs> yeah. And we, I laughed hysterically wow. with Steve Garvey. He goes, are you sure well, it's just, Steve Harvey? Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's a totally different story and by the way he wasn't famous when i was a child but uh she wasn't boss hog (laughs) i was wade boggs (laughs) there was boss hog yeah so you spent five years in the minors five and a half five and a half yeah were they as fun as bull durham makes it look hell no (laughs) (laughs) no no uh actually i i take off spend my 18th birthday in elmira new york call home um 18 years old i'm 18 years old scared to death first time away from home scared to death don't know what to do uh sunday afternoon um everything's locked up we stayed at uh, elmira women's college and it was all closed up and everything and and so i call home on a pay phone and get my dad on the horn and i said uh dad this is brutal i don't know what to do god damn it find a pay uh find a hotel and I went, okay, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do after that. He says, grow up and become a man. And I went, 
wow, that's coming from somebody that was spending his 16th birthday in Guadalcanal. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, great. Oh. So I walk about three blocks and there was a hotel there, a motel. And uh, it's probably the Bates Motel or something like that. <laughs> and there were only like six or seven rooms. So I got, I'm dragging suitcase and carrying my baseball bag and I'm out in the front of my room and all of a sudden this Dodge Charger pulls up they go you Wade Boggs and I said yeah John Taglarino from uh Tampa <laughs> he, he played at TC and, yeah. and he had been there in 75 but he's going back on on uh rehab assignment in 76 yeah. and I went oh my god am I so happy to see you <laughs> he goes I'll pick you up tomorrow morning at 7 30 I said great <laughs> So I call home and said, Dad, I got it all under control and all this. I'm a man. <laughs> Turns out you good. good advice, Dad. Oh, my God. And so I come in, and we got we got uh, 50 guys in the locker room on the team. We got wow. 50 players. Wow. And, I mean, I've never been around Latin guys that don't speak English, so you don't know how to communicate. Yeah. So we probably got 15, 20 Latin guys from Dominican, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, everywhere. And Dick Berardino's a manager, and and so now I'm facing guys that are 22, 23 year old coming out of college with sliders and all of this. And I said, "What in the hell's a slider?" Yeah. And I have no idea what it was because, and really, in high school you got fastball, curveball, and yeah. that was basically it. And now I'm I'm facing these guys. So wound up, Elmire, New York, um, hit 268, and Thank God it took all the ropes and knives out because I was going to hang myself at 268. <laughs> 268. So Dick Berardino goes, well, we don't really know what we're going to do and everything like this, and it'll probably evaluate on spring training coming up and all of this. Well, he had sent in a report, and I had found out later, to have me released. Really? So I said, wow, I was the first Hall of Famer you were ever going to release. <laughs> and I, till this day, I still tease him about it. And it. He's so wonderful. We got a great relationship. And then got married that off season. 76 Jesus. at 18. Oh my God. Yeah, it'll be 47 this year with Debbie. Yeah. yeah. Holy cow. So we got married, went to Winston Salem and a one bedroom apartment, kind of unfurnished, kind of furnished kind of thing and hit 332 that year. Yeah. And that's when everything exploded. Really? Um, next spring, uh, next spring training, they assigned me to Bristol, double A. And find out that Debbie's pregnant with our daughter, Megan. So we go to double A in 78. And now Megan's born in, in, uh, in December that year. So 79, we have a, a child in the minor leagues. I and I it. asked for $50 a month more and they wouldn't give it to me. Really? Yeah. I said, well, hopefully down the road, I can make that up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because so many people these days, plan their children and go like my best friend and 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 i look at it i I look at enviously my best friend didn't have kids until he was like 40 40 years old 42 years old and he he was a millionaire at that point him and his wife both were millionaires wow and i go that's gotta be nice and 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 all the things all the trappings that would have made life easier uh there they do and 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 i see and my me and my wife will see and but he will say to me you know, he witnessed me when I we had kids broke. We didn't plan it. I wasn't even headlining when I had Georgia. I was just featuring. I was making seven hundred fifty dollars a week, and I had to pay travel, hotel, and I had to give my part to my manager. I walked with such little money, right? But he was there during that, and he remembers. He was so broke. He was coming to my house for dinners that back then. Wow. And so, but it's nice to. It's refreshing to hear just the, that bootstrap family of like yeah yeah, yeah let's do it Me, megan was the only child in the minor leagues there were no other children from anybody in the whole minor leagues she was the only child roaming around in the minor leagues so we'd go and then went two years to Pawtucket in 80 and 81 and none of the other married none of the other mar- married guys children or anything really? like that which is kind of rare in triple a yeah. normally everybody kind of has one or two or something like that but no she was the only child and 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 then in in 81 was 
the year that I had uh, led the international league in hitting and hit three, 334 that year, led the international league in hitting, broke like 17 records and all of this. And at the end of the game, the last game of the season, uh, Joe Morgan is calling in everybody uh, that's going to the big leagues. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting there and I'm packed in front of my locker and I'm waiting. I'm any waiting, idea? Any I'm idea? Waiting. I thought it was a no brainer. Yeah. So Joe Morgan comes back out and seven guys had walked in and walked out and everything like this. So he walks out and I said, well, I guess he was saving me for last or something. He says, Boggs, you have a good winner. And I went, what? I, it was like somebody hit me with a two by four in the back of the head. I said, I, I didn't get called up. He said, no, Boggs, they, they didn't call you up. And I went, what in the hell do you have to do around this gin joint to, to, to make it to the big leagues? Yeah. And I went, all right. So I walk outside and I got tears in my eyes and, and I got my bag and everything like that. And I said, let's go. I picked up Megan and we got in the red van and drove all the way from Pawtucket to Tampa, Florida. (laughs) And I walk in the next morning, walk in the next morning. And my dad looks at me and goes, what in the hell are you doing here? They didn't call you up. No. He goes, oh, he was livid. He was absolutely livid. Oh yeah. And so I said, I don't know. I just got to figure out what I'm going to do. And a week later, I'm in Puerto Rico <laughs> playing winter ball. <laughs> oh, oh God, that was. And then added to the 40 man roster, so I was invited to spring training in '82. Yeah, and that was the, that was the break that I needed. To, really, yeah, you know, just golly, take a look at me, you know, kind of thing. And, God, that's got to be. You know, it's. It, I I remember the frustration with comedy, and not to, to once again. I'm just trying to relate. I remember the frustration with comedy, but and the, but there was this intangible in comedy. It's like you could have killed as hard as you wanted, but someone could always write you off and say, "Oh yeah, but it's not that great a material. He's not that smart. He's just a he's there's a likability that he's got. There's Other all these people's opinions yeah. are are really what move it forward because the the front office back in the day they never really come around and watch players or anything. They, they rely on the managers and coaches to send in reports, and then they would evaluate the reports of what they sent in. They didn't get to see you playing on a daily basis. It's not like today where they're, I'm sure they have live feeds of games and clips of games and, oh, and they have, they sizzle have so reels. Many, they have so many uh, cross-checkers that they go around and, and make sure that this guy's ready to be called up and all yes. of that. And, hey, go watch this guy for a week. Let's see what we got and various things like that. But back in the day, they just fill out reports and send them in. And then when I made the ball club in, in 82, Ralph Houck was my manager. And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, uh, the, the, the manager in, uh, in Winston-Salem and Bristol, he, he was sending in reports that you couldn't field. And I went, really? He goes, well, you opened my eye here in spring training because Carney Lancer would play the first five and I'd play the end of the game. Yeah. Well, I said – Dude, I'm diving for everything. And I'm I'm gonna I don't care where it is. I'm getting dirty. I'm diving and all yeah. this. And dive, make a play, throw the guy out and everything like this. He says, We all knew you could hit. We were just seeing if you could field. And you opened a lot of eyes here. Wow. And I went, Well, I appreciate that, but wow, it's sort of like, okay, they're sending bad reports on you, and really the the reports aren't kind of true. Yeah. And that's that's the disturbing part about a majority of that. And I, well, when I was with Tampa Bay and assistant general manager, I went down to see Josh Hamilton play for a week. Yeah. And, uh, him and, uh, Joe Kennedy. So when I got back to Chuck Lamar and filling out the reports, they got a rating system, 80, 20 and everything in there yeah. was, he got a 75 arm, 70 speed and all this. <laughs> I wrote on the report. Should be in the big leagues tomorrow. Really? That's all I wrote. I didn't evaluate him. I didn't put anything <laughs> in there. I said, he needs to be in the big leagues tomorrow. That's yeah. all I put. So I'm in my office, and here comes Chuck Lamar. He's screaming, Box, get in here. Get in here. What the hell is this? He's showing me the report. And I said, what? That's my opinion. Yeah. He should be in the big leagues tomorrow. You don't need to evaluate any numbers. He can play in the big leagues right now. Yeah. So – that was how dynamic this kid was at 18 years old. And I said, he's just, 
He's the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah, he was spectacular. He was, he was special. And God, he you know, was spectacular. Then like when the, the car accident and then he got, you know, down the, the, the wayward path and everything like that. He he was just, I mean, he was a man playing with boys. That's basically what he was. He was a man playing with boys. And yeah. and he for those seven days, he put on a spectacle. Really? Oh my God. Homers, stolen bases. Hey, I'll hit a triple for you this time. And <laughs> you talk about fly. He could absolutely fly. Really? Yeah, he was, he was, he was one, probably the best 18-year-old kid I've ever seen. I didn't get to see A-Rod at 18 or anything, yeah. uh, but or Griffey at 18. But I, I guarantee I didn't see Bryce Harper at 18 or something like mm. that. But, but Josh Hamilton was, he was a cat's meow. He really was. Do we, who is, uh, who's playing for, um, uh, the Yankees right now bat and forth, uh, the big kid judge. Yeah. Yeah. So Aaron judge where we go to a Yankees game recently and, uh, Aaron judge is up at bat and he's just, he is spect. I mean, he's amazing. And then whoever gets up to bat next, I go, how tiny is he? And they go, what? Do you remember this beat? I go, I go, I go. And they go, well, that, no, he's like 6'2". And I go, no, he's not 6'2". If he's 6'2", then Aaron Judge is 6'7". And someone goes, I think he's 6'6". <laughs> I was like, he's 6'6"? Well, it's, it's funny when Judge and Altuve get to ne uh, stand next to each yeah. other, like on second base. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, look yeah. at that. Gosh. Yeah. That's uh yeah. What what is Josh Hamilton doing now? Do you know? No idea. He's out of he's out of baseball. I haven't I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Whether or not he's involved with baseball, but I, it bums me out when you see, especially I'm a I am a big drinker. When you when you see that get the best of someone, or or, or drugs and alcohol, it it breaks my heart because I just want to go. Yeah, it's a it's a, a path that some guys take, and and you know I mean it's documented with Doc and and strawberry and all God. of that and and strawberry would come down to rehabs down here, uh yeah. down in Tampa. I remember, right. yeah, and same with Doc Gooden, like just it. It's crazy, and I'm I'm certain people probably look at me and go, uh, but can, you know, but you you know you, you when you do drink or whatever, clearly I I'm enough in the in the in my swing zone where I can take care of myself. I make sure I go to sleep. I make sure I work out. I may not be the healthiest version of myself when I'm partying, but I I, I do my best. And it's has I'd hear stories about Josh Hamilton where he'd be like, he'd be doing great, and then all of a sudden just and it would and and it that bums me out yeah yeah it's a shame it bums me out because you you as well you're a, you're one of those guys that old school they don't make them anymore i don't think that is made anymore it's like but it's the thing that obviously and i and we'll jump ahead for a second but the legend of you i mean you know there are kids that are doing this i think pete was one of them he knows you through always sunny right and not your your legendary career right like that's crazy and i heard your son is the one that convinced you to do always sunny uh finally talked me into it yeah right. i had turned it down originally really yeah and he says dad you know you know how big this is it's a it's massive no, it's huge it's massive yeah, it's, it's almost like you've gotten this second life this legendary secondary well, life brett's because. in it brett's in it for more seconds than i am i really? think i'm in for a minute 47 seconds and he's in for like 220 <laughs> he's the one that gets all the cans poured in his lap That's, when they're talking and yeah. they pour all the cans in his lap I, i'll he's tell you right, the magazine right there i'll and, tell you this is going to sound absolutely sacrilegious i have not seen that and i will tell you this i said this to cowhead there or mike calza this morning i don't even know the story i know the story that apparently you drank like 100 beers from from a cross country trip, seventy three. Wait, wait, hold on. Can you can you do me the? Will you tell me the legend? Tell me the story yeah. because I don't know. I, I all I know about you is your career, right? And then and then this is like the. It's like it's like going like no I I I know of King Kong but I didn't haven't heard about the Empire State Building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, you were on Skull Island. Yeah, yeah. you were on Skull Island. <laughs> yeah, really? So so what is the story? If you don't mind. Mm. The Skylight Calendar. I'm blown away. I love my Skylight frame. Now they have a Skylight Calendar. The Skylight Calendar is a smart touchscreen calendar and organizer for all your chores, groceries, and to-dos. It automatically syncs 
all of the different digital calendars and events that your family uses and shows them all in one beautiful touchscreen display. Skylight Calendar is the best way to give your family peace of mind to enjoy all the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is super easy to set up and use. It works by syncing events from already existing calendars you have, including Google, Outlook, and Apple calendars. You can also add events directly by using their touch screen with the free Skylight mobile app. It shows all family events together in one spot so you can see what everyone else has going on each week. Families are more likely to actually check it since it's always up to date so they don't have to go to, like, hey, mom, what's our schedule today? Hey, mom. What's our schedule today? Or, hey, Leanne, what's our schedule today? (laughs) Events are color-coded so you can visually map out your family's plans for the week into beautifully color-coded time blocks. I've been saying nonstop, I wish I could use my wall calendar. I wish I could get my phone calendar into a wall calendar. It's like Skylight knew what I wanted and they made it. This will be a mainstay in my tour bus, in my house, in my office, at the studio. This is a no-brainer. As a special limited time offer for our listeners, get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to Skylight cal.com slash bird to get $15 off your purchase of a skylight calendar go to skylightcal.com slash bird that's s-k-y-l-i-g-h-t-c-a-l dot com slash bird mary balls miss from our friends over at manscape the holidays are approaching but what if i told you that the celebrations are starting early this year it turns out the perfect gift does exist and who else to bring it down your chimney than the leaders in below the waist grooming Keep calm and let your balls jingle this season with Manscaped's brand new Performance Package 5.0 Ultra featuring the new Lawnmower 5.0. Watch all your wishes and mistletoe kisses come true. Look nice when you're going to be naughty. Go to manscaped.com and use code BERT for 20% off plus free shipping. Unwrap the gift of smoothness this season with Manscaped. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. This thing is so badass. It is the fifth generation trimmer featuring two next gen blade heads, a standard trimmer blade for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go for that smooth finish. You know, the one your heart desires. Trust me when I say I've lost weight and I can finally shave my balls again. I can see what I'm doing. And I love shaved balls. I love shaved balls. I shave it night i wish i could show you manscaped if you could do one ad with me i would love to show you my grooming habits get on it manscaped because i really tighten my shit up nice and you should too this christmas get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code bert at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code bert manscaped get your jingle balls ready for the holidays so what is the story if you don't mind mm. Not at all. I, I've I, 1980, 1988, 89. Uh, we're leaving Boston um, and uh, Sunday day game and we're leaving Boston. We're flying to LA. So you pack some roadies to the airport and all of this and, and <laughs> you got them this, in your case and all that. This makes me very excited. So you pack some roadies to the airport and depending on traffic, you're, don't want to leave yourself short. Yeah. Okay. So you get on the plane and I was playing blackjack with some other players and, and was taking a couple sips and yeah, I'll take another one. I'll take another one and dealing, dealing, take a couple sips. Yeah, I'll take another one. So I was like two sipping beers and, and, we're we're probably over Nebraska or somewhere like this, and and card game's going well. And one of the players looks at me and goes, "Bugs, do you realize you you you've had like fifty one beers?" <laughs> and I went, "Really? <laughs> Didn't seem like it." Okay, all right, cool. He says, "We still got a, another hour to go." I said, "Well, let's see how many we can get then." <laughs> so, so the The final tally was 73. (laughs) You get off the plane. And uh, so five or six of us decided to go down to the Red Onion down in uh, Laguna Beach. Yeah. And wound up having a total of 107. (laughs) 
was the final total for the day. And the next day we're facing Mark Langston and wound up going two for three with two walks and two doubles off of Mark Langston the next day. Holy shit. (laughs) That's awesome. So it was one of those, um, don't try it at home kind of things, but please do don't try it when you, you know, you're on the road or something. (laughs) And, uh, so now it, 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 it grew and grew and grew and always sunny had approached me about them. The episode was, uh, uh, gang beats Boggs, and they were going to try to reproduce it from Philly to LA and see if they could beat my record. Yeah. Well, it, it was the, the writing in it was, was spectacular. Yeah. I mean, it, it was absolutely spectacular and how, when I saw the final product and it was all put together and, and I'm, I'm a ghost kind of imagery that, that Charlie's looking at and, and they're all doing things on the plane. And, and Danny DeVito is just, he's an absolute hoot. I love Danny to to death. And, and, uh, and, and actually the producer came over and asked me if my son wanted to be in it. And I said, yeah. He said, but he can't talk. He doesn't have a SAG card. I said, Oh, okay. All right. So they bumped somebody out of the seat. One of the extras yeah. bumped them out of the seat. Brett sits down. So they're talking, 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 and then dump all the cans in Brett's lap and all of that. And so he got to be a, a part of the show. It was really neat. And, That's uh, great. like I said, originally I'd turned it down cause I, I, I don't really like to promote that, Yeah, but you know, I, 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 well, it happened. I can't. And then my wife, Debbie sits there and goes, well, bad publicity is better. And- <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because it's what it's the lead in. A lot of these kids will have, it, it sounds crazy, but you know, if these days, if you don't have a crazy haircut or, or tats on your face, no one's watching Yeah, and, and you need, you know, I mean, I was a, I was a busting my ass as a comic forever. And then all of a sudden when I, everyone heard that I got involved with the Russian mafia and robbed a train, it was like, okay, now we, and, and I'm shirtless, all the things it's like the stamp. And it's like these kids these days go, oh, I know Wade Boggs. And you're like, and I, I come at it from like a pure fan standpoint and everyone's brought it up to me and I go, yeah, I, I know the story I've heard, but like, I don't know what I was like. Yeah. Those, those seem like the days that I would have liked playing baseball. I mean, that was, that was a neat thing when I, when I got to do cheers, um, I approached John McNamara in spring training. I said, uh, Mac, I got an opportunity to go to LA. I said, I said, I just need two days off. Can you give me two days off? He says, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, no, you don't understand. I'm doing a, a TV show. Cheers. Cheers. What is it? I said, well, it's a bar in Boston kind of thing and all of that. And, and they wrote a script about me into the show get out of here. I'll cover for you. So Mac <laughs> let me go. Yeah. So I go out and go through rehearsal and wardrobe and makeup and, and, and all of that. And, and, and Jim Burroughs comes out and, and a couple of the other directors and, and said, you know, it's, it's going to be filmed in front of a live audience. And I went, well, how many people? He's probably 1700. I said, Mr. Burroughs, I play in front of 51,000. <laughs> little teeny audiences you know maybe we're in cleveland or somewhere that's 1700 but other than that it it won't bother me and he goes oh okay all right and we go through it one take we did it in one take really they chased me out of the bar and i'm running and they bring the pants back everyone said their lines and and ad-libbed a little bit especially kirstie alley oh god rest her soul um, especially Kirstie Alley, when she said, Wade ball and, and, yeah. <laughs> and did it that way. And I went, Oh, sort of startled me, but no one missed a beat. And so all of a sudden I'm up at the top of the stairs where they ran me out and I hear cut wrap, put it in a can. And I went, no way. We're done. <laughs> Come on. I flew to LA for this one take. So one take Wade's right around, you know, he just one take Wade. That's it. One take Wade. <laughs> I'm 10 take Bert. Yeah. <laughs> it takes me forever the uh that what was uh like you played you played when they started like i say cleaning up baseball but like where beers were where t- tobacco was no longer in the clubhouse like uh towards the end of my career towards the end of your career yeah. it, it, 
I mean, um, U.S. Tobacco, um, it was like a convenience store. I mean, you had Skoll, Copenhagen, did you Levi did? Garrett, Redman. Did you ever do I chewed too? during the game for uh, oh, yeah, of course. for 10 years. 10 years, I chewed during the game. And the last eight years, I just went to gum. Yeah. Um, and then dipped until my uh, father passed away. And then moved on from that. Yeah. But I mean, there's just rolls and rolls of Copenhagen and skull for these guys. They and, just line them up and, in the dugouts. And back when I broke in, in 82 guys were smoking in the dugout. Really? Yeah. And I, I, I thought that was kind of <laughs> like weird, but yeah. you know, and you look at Jim Leland, you know, he's lighting up heaters all over the place and, <laughs> and, and uh, Earl Weaver, you know, they're yeah. all, all those, the old timey guys are always smoking in the uh, dugout, but, but that was, yeah, it was. And then uh, major league baseball banned it and said, you know, no more. And then clubhouse guys couldn't go out and buy it for you or they were fired. So that's how major league baseball, if you want to bring it yourself. And then they said, no more, uh, no more spitting on the field. And so that sort of took oh, out, God. like, if you got a chaw in and you're sitting there, I'm not going to swallow it. Yeah. So I'm spitting on the field, you know? And yeah. so that was that sort of fine line, like, you know, guys going to Seven Eleven or what have you to get his own chewing tobacco. And, and, and you're telling him he can't spit on the field, but you know, he, he can chew it if he buys it himself. And I went, wow, that's kind of, kind of crazy, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, they're, I mean, there are a lot – guys just eat seeds nowadays. I, I don't think there, there are a lot of chewers or dippers any, anymore. I don't, I don't see anybody with a, a big chew in anybody. or with a big chew in. And and majority of guys don't play with dip in because it, it just moves all over your mouth and swallow it if you head first slide or something like that. But I chew tobacco. You, we could chew tobacco my senior year. I mean, you could chew tobacco if you wanted to during the games or especially during legion ball uh i just i was i i'd get a buzz and i couldn't and i'd be like well now i'm buzzed i why don't i just play drunk i was like oh, i'm out <laughs> i'm out but yeah I, I quit i quit dipping tobacco when i was in college i dipped from like ninth grade until college and i miss it every single day mm. i loved it so much i they have a thing buffalo zero that uh has no nicotine in it All right and i'll sneak those in just go, just for the smell uh, just for the ritual of the smell right and the scent and the putting it in and yeah. then but that ultimately you're like all right uh just staining my teeth there you go yeah the <laughs> uh <laughs> but that's uh that's crazy what was what were beers always allowed in the locker rooms oh yeah 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 that's the best what would you what was your did you have a post-game ritual like, do you look back? It's like I, right now, I'm not drinking on the road, and I and it's I'm hyper aware of just what my getting off stage, cocktail in a Starbucks class, sitting down, eating dinner, and decompressing the show with right. the co other comics. Right. Like, and I, and I miss it a little bit. I've changed it. I've changed it now, just as I'm not boozing. But I'll, I'll start again in a couple of weeks. But uh, what, did you have a post game ritual? Not really. At home, I had to drive home, so I had yeah. all the kids and the wife and everything like that. So I, I didn't drink after the games. Yeah, I just go home, have a bite to eat after the game, a couple hot dogs, some barbecue chips or something like that, and an iced tea. <laughs> yeah, and then Saturday night, Debbie and I would go out and 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 eat, drink, and and yeah. that with friends and and that kind of thing. Road's different. I mean, you're not driving; you're taking cabs everywhere, and you're you're just nothing to do basically on the road. So, yeah. so we just, you know, guys go, Hey, let's, let's go to s here and just hang out and have who's, some beers. And who's the funnest guy to, to be on the road with? I, I had quite a, Jimmy key. He was a left-handed pitcher came over to New York from uh, Toronto. Um, he was a good running buddy. Um, believe it or not, one of, one of our jobs in New York was to keep Steve Howell straight really yeah yeah to keep him off the cocaine we had to take his room key we had to make sure we had to tape his door to where he didn't open the door yeah. during the night 
<laughs> and so, yeah, that was Mr. Mr. Steinbrenner called uh, Jimmy Key and, and myself in and said, uh, you take care of that Hal. We, we need him pitching down the stretch and all of that. I, I said, yeah, boss, we'd, we'd take care of him yeah. and uh, keep him off, you know, keep him out of Hawaii. I mean, he'd get, <laughs> he'd get boomed up and, and get on a plane and go to Hawaii. For real? Yeah. <laughs> he, he wound up in Hawaii one time. Like, anybody seen Doogie? I think he's in Hawaii. <laughs> this, like, he woke up on a beach in Hawaii one time. Oh, yeah. So, so how? What was? Uh, if you could compare, and I know this is probably sacrilege in baseball, but playing New York, playing in New York versus playing in Boston, and the fans—is it a similar experience? I had the best of both worlds. Two, yeah. two great, two gr- the best. knowledge. The knowledge that those two fan bases have. Yeah. The amount of history that's come through both cities, um, the amount of great players that have come through both cities, um, and having an opportunity to go to World Series for both individual clubs. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that, that that when I was there and and us trying to break the curse from 1918, that that was the big thing that that sort of upset me to the to the fact that we couldn't get the job done it was up to us to break the curse and thank god for 2004 came along and they finally won yeah and since then they won four championships uh in boston and i think that that the negativity of that fan base has changed immensely and i mean in the in the lean years it was pretty miserable in boston i mean fans they didn't have a lot to brag about. Now they've got a lot to brag about. Yeah. And not so much in New York right now because <laughs> they're struggling as as mightily as you can imagine. But um yeah, it was it was a transition that I I really never had in the back of my mind did that you I think, was gonna go to New ever, York. Yeah, did you uh, that my first contract offer when I was a free agent in nineteen ninety two was uh uh the Dodgers. Really? Yeah, they offered me a year and a, a year with an option, and I wanted I wanted longer security. Yeah, and I didn't think I was going to get it with a year and an option in L.A. and then have to go after they didn't pick up my option. Then I got to go someplace else. And the second call was Mr. Steinbrenner. Really? So then we met at the uh, the Causeway over here at Mr. Steinbrenner's yeah. uh, uh, hotel, and at that time he was suspended. Uh, for all the uh, allegations against Dave Winfield and, and various yeah. things like that. So Joe Malloy, uh, his son-in-law, uh, met with my agent and I, Alan Nero, and and uh, said that, uh, hey, would $11 million for three years keep you in uh, uh, pinstripes? And I went, well, I'm going to have to go out and call my wife on my uh, poor cell phone. So I run outside, say, "Honey, we're going to New York." And I hung up, and and, she, and so then after the meeting, I call her back, and she was frantic about what? What? I mean, you didn't tell me anything. I said I didn't have to. You had to get back before they changed their mind. Yeah. And <laughs> and at the time, we're sitting at a table like this. There was a table next to the window, and really didn't pay any attention to the gentleman over there reading the newspaper. So I said, I said, well, you, you got yourself a Yankee and the paper lowers. It's Mr. Steinbrenner. Oh, and he winks no at me. Shit. And he winks at me. Oh. And I went, hi, boss. <laughs> and so boom, I'm a yeah, I'm a I'm a Yankee. And I went, wow, this it's gonna be great. My first time back in Boston. <laughs> God. Oh, it oh, was, that it was, was loud. Fucking it was loud. What was your relationship with Boston at the time? Uh was it contentious? You leaving the, there? Uh, I was sort of run out of town. I was sort of. I heard I was run out of town. Mrs. Yaki at the end of the '91 season had called Debbie and I over at the last game of the season. We're in the parking lot leaving, and her driver comes over and says, "Mrs. Yaki would like a word with you." And I said, "Oh yeah, absolutely." And so I walk over and, and uh, so I said, "Mrs. Yaki," I said, uh, "What's on your mind?" She said. Um, I need to ask you a question if this is possible. Said, would $37 million for seven years keep you in Boston? I said, Mrs. Yaki, do you have a napkin? <laughs> I said, where's a pen and a napkin? I'll sign it right now. 
Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Don't worry about it. Lou and John will get a hold and, and we'll, we'll iron it out and all of this January 2nd, she slips and falls in a tub and 90, uh, January 2nd, 92 slips and falls in a tub and dies. I go to spring training in March. They take the offer off the table. It's off the table. They come back with a year and an option with a very little raise or anything like this. And I said, wow. So we negotiate all the way through spring training. And then my agent said, after spring training, we're not going to negotiate anymore. Mm -hmm. So then I was the bad guy. I was a bad guy. And so now going through the season and, and, and the Herald and the Globe would write articles about me and this and that. Oh my God. And I can't imagine. And just getting buried and getting buried to the fact and, and, and various players came out and said, he, Oh, he's, he's not a good teammate and this and that. And, uh, and I'm going, what, where's all this coming from yeah. an anonymous source? And I'm going, really, there's an anonymous source is uh, okay. Who's that anonymous source. And, and so at the end of the season, they didn't pick up my uh, arbitration rights and I became a free agent. And then the Boston Globe and Herald and all of those, right? That that Wade Boggs, the trader, is going to New York f- for less money and all of this just to win a championship. And to win a championship, the Yankees are in last place. Yeah. All the time. I'm going there to win a championship to a last place team? Mm-hmm. No, I'm going there with an opportunity to play and and possibly build a team and win a, a championship because Boston evidently didn't want me. Yeah. And then... 2016 comes around and Sam Kennedy for the Red Sox says, Hey, wait, we're going to retire your number in Boston. One of the greatest days of my life. Yeah. Other than the birth of Brett and Megan yeah. <laughs> and my children. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean, other than that, one of the greatest days of your life. Now I'm back in the graces. I work for the Red Sox now and, and everything your, your number come went, full circle. Was your number given to another dude when you went to, uh, yeah, Lou Maloney. Are you serious? The very next year, when I went to the Yankees, they gave it. They gave it out. They, well, they actually, it was they gave it to a, um, a Venezuelan pitcher, and a call up in September. Yeah. And then the next year, Lou Maloney uh, took it for a couple to three years, and and every time I'd see him on the field, I said, "Hey, Lou, you you getting all those hits that I left in that uni?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, okay, one of those. And then Brock Holt had it when they retired it. So actually he took it off of his back and gave it to me at the presentation at the fan fest and oh, all of that. Nice. And at he least went, did the right thing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I kind of wish my dad had an opportunity to see my number retired because yeah. it was going to go up next to Ted and to see my number alongside Ted would have, would have just been unbelievable for my dad. Cause in spring training, my dad is sitting in the dugout and talk to Ted for hours really unbelievable yeah they had a great relationship they talk about the war and and various things like that but i'd say dad how much time do you talk about hitting no oh, probably 45 minutes <laughs> and i went i'll be damned 45 minutes with ted williams there you go and that, that was his that was his because he just idolized ted yeah you know to the fact that the greatest player that ever walked the planet so but and then my dad got to meet Stan Musial at the Hall of Fame and oh, wow. and bend his ear and and every and Al Kaline and and talk to them about yeah. watching them play when he was young and all of that. So it, that was the neat part about that. Yeah. God, I should have had a boy. <laughs> <laughs> I could. I would love. I would love that. That would have been funny uh-huh. shit. Yeah, that's who who was was there a change of ownership in 2016 that that made the decision to retire your number um yeah was it was it the new people now mm, one person left one person left one person left and sam kennedy said that uh we're gonna we're gonna make this happen that's- and i went wow and so now working for the red sox and the relationship's phenomenal and I, I couldn't be happier. It's funny. I know. I mean, I, I, when I think of you, I definitely think Red Sox. I definitely think Red yeah. Sox. Yeah, I do. I, well, actually, I do, too, because I spent five and a half years in the minor leagues and then 11 in the big leagues and so many great things. But the moment in the sun is the horse. I mean, that's. Oh, that's, it's, the, that's, it's, 
It's the that's the greatest thing I ever did because it made me a lot of money with that horse picture. I bet. I know. So wait, yeah. what's the st- so that is the for for people who don't know, you guys win the World Series, right? We're dogpiled on the mound, yeah, and everybody's just and I'm crying like a little twelve year old kid. You won the World. I won Series. the World Series, and so we're just and I'm hugging Wetland, I'm kissing Wetland, I'm and everybody's and i'm on the bottom with wetland and then somebody in the dog pile said hey let's take a victory lap and the strange thing about this is usually new york sports you got to rush off the field because the fans are storming the field yeah and they all stood in front of their seats and applauded no one charged the field i mean believe it or not there were 450 police horses around the field so they couldn't get on the field yeah but everybody just applauded so to reward them we took a victory lap next thing i know i'm in left center field on the back of a police horse have no idea how i got up on this police horse and i'm riding around with number one like this flash bulbs are going off and and then the the iconic picture with me and the police officer and bow the horse and and i'm doing number one and i've never gone back to look at the video to see how i got back up on that horse really i don't want to know <laughs> i don't want to know it's just it's it's just i and i'm making eye contact with everybody in the stadium practically yeah. and waving to them and pointing at them and and doing this and everybody's taking a picture taking a picture taking a picture and and not to win a championship in 18 years and the very first image that you see is me on a police horse that sort of signifies in a, in a time capsule, if they were to ever put that in there, that they open the time capsule and goes, Oh, that's 1996 Yankees won the world series. Yeah. I just, I moved to, I moved to New York the very next year. I moved to New York the next year. And, uh, there was a comic that told a story about that. He had snuck into that game with a press pass and he had ended up on the field and he was saying it was this he would tell the story on stage but he was like fucking wade boggs <laughs> fucking wade boggs and i'm a kid from tampa <laughs> right yeah listening to the right. story going fucking wade boggs <laughs> it's, it's such an epic picture such an epic it really was really was and and i mean it was just like not scripted at all no. and like i said i don't know how i got up on that horse and and a police horse they're about 22 hands high. If, yeah. And I mean, you need a, a small ladder to just to get up on the back of one of these horses. And, and I don't know if I had assistance or what have you, but it, it was worth it. God. Yeah. It was fun. Is there anyone you, is there anyone like as a, like as an, in retrospect that you go, man, I would have loved to play. I would have fit in great on that team. Like I always used to look at the Phillies with Dykstra and, and Kruk and and those lunatics, I go. I bet I would have had fun on that. Oh team. yeah, the 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 insanity uh, Yankee years. Yeah, with Reggie and all. I mean, they had, you know, they had Craig Nettles. I mean, Craig I wasn't gonna, Nettles. I wasn't gonna beat him out. But but <laughs> yeah, with all of those, with Goose and Gidry and and oh, yeah. those, I mean, those are two of my favorites. So they used to anyway. play, They used to play those on. They used to play those on like I think Channel Forty Eight in tampa right yeah and and they play the yankees games yeah i mean the bronx bombers you know and yeah. and 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 they were always on the back page for either getting a fight in an elevator billy martin was he was beating up somebody or yeah or something like that but uh yeah because i i mean i just love goose and i love gator and and every chance that i get when i'm around them it's like god we get along so great together it would have been great to you know play with them and yeah that's probably one of the where I would have fit in. Yeah, the the uh, I, I the this uh, the sex years of of Billy Martin and Mickey Mantle and those years of the Yankees were Ooh. pretty fucking legendary. Yeah, big time. I would have loved those too. Wow. Yeah, Mickey. Did you ever meet Mickey Mantle? You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets to your next big event. Game time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best prices guaranteed, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped up for the fun you'll have. You get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what you're getting when you arrive. Buy tickets within a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're set. Isla and I use this for Metallica. We've used it. Isla is really into concerts right now. By the way, I talk about Isla so much, she's the only one left in my house. 
And every one of these sponsors Isla loves, and she loves game time. Uh, Corn is coming. Uh, who else? She literally yells down, can you hook me up? And I say no. And she goes, all right, game time. <laughs> Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code BERTCAST for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code B-E-R-T-C-A-S-T for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. We are supported by DoorDash. My family is supported by DoorDash. DoorDash has knows the code to my gate. <laughs> Low on time? Make the hours you've got a whole lot happier with the Dash Pass from DoorDash. Dash Pass members get $0 delivery fees and up to 10% off eligible DoorDash orders, including groceries, drinks, personal care items, and more. Dash Pass makes delivery even more worth it helping members save more than $35 per month on average. Plus, Dash Pass delivers way more than just tonight's dinner, including special access to experiences, promotions, and Dash Pass exclusive menu items, all for only $9.99 a month. Sign up for Dash Pass now, and you'll get your first month for free. Trust me, I put Isla Kreischer on Dash Pass, and it has saved us so much money. This is a child that does not how to know how to open a refrigerator door. She doesn't know how to do anything but get on her phone from her room, order DoorDash, and go down and pick it up. And quite honestly, sometimes she doesn't even go down and pick it up. She'll just yell down, it's here. Put a little joy back into your schedule. Sign up for Dash Pass today. Use code BERT23 and get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $12 or more after signing up for Dash Pass. Subject to change, terms apply. That's 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $12 or more after signing up for Dash Pass with code BERT23. Subjects change, terms apply. Sign up for more. Become a Dash Pass member today. Mickey, did you ever meet Mickey Mantle? Yes, I did. When I, uh, his last year before he died in 95. Really? Yeah, he was an old timers game and he's sitting in uh, Buck Show Walter's office. And I walk in with a ball and he goes, Sorry, I can't sign it. And I went, oh, it's for my dad. You don't understand. He had just come back from uh, um, overseas and saw you play, and you laid down a two-strike bunt. And he thought that was the neatest thing ever. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, okay, what's his name? I said, uh, Winfield. And he goes, to Winfield, all the best, Mickey Mantle. And I went, oh, my God. I, my dad's just going to flip out over this one. So, it was, yeah, and then uh, coincidentally, um, I think he passed away about two, two weeks after Old Timer's Day that year. Oh, but I wow. had, that was the only time I had ever met him. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, you walk in, and bigger in life. You I know, I said, like, oh my gosh, Mickey Mantle. And it's like, oh, Lord. And, I mean, that, that was the neat thing about not knowing Hall of Famers when I got to the Hall of Fame, and I'm going, wow, I get to meet Bob Feller and I get to meet Lou Brock. I get to meet Stan Musial, you know, and, yeah. and the names just keep going and going and going. And I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, all the greats that I watched when I was a little kid, you know, I mean, Hank Aaron walks in and I'm shaking like crazy. And I mean, I listened to all the Milo Hamilton and Ernie Johnson radio broadcast here comes Hank Aaron up to the plate, and, and I'm going, oh my gosh! You know, you just get goosebumps. Yeah. And there it goes. It's it's a deep drive to left center field, and there he hit home run, hammer and Hank Aaron. And I'm going, oh my god! You know, you just get goosebumps listening yeah. to the radio, and that's all we had back in Brunswick. And and going out to the ninth inning, here we go, and we got we got a we got to hold them Braves, and and we got Phil Negro going for the for the complete game. Yeah, and, you know, you're just all these going through your mind and here I am going to my dad's softball games in, in Brunswick, Georgia, and I'm six, seven years old listening to the Braves games on a on a sixty nine or a sixty three comet. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, that we went, you know, it's you forget the people that have uh real estate in your head, the the names that you remember uh growing up. Oh sure. You know, there was um we just went to the uh Negro baseball 
Hall of Fame in Kansas City. In right? Kansas yeah. City, mm-hmm. and I was a big Buck O'Neill fan, but based mostly from the documentary that um, that uh, Ken Burns did. Right, Buck O'Neill just stood out as just such a just a big personality, and they were showing uh, they had a they have a whole thing for Latin American pitchers, and J.R. Richards, who I. I'm a, I mean, I, it, that was when the Astros were the Astros. That was when, that was like in the, the biggest, and I just went, holy crap. I, I I haven't thought of that name in so many years, but I know that. I know J.R. Rich. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Right. And I went through that Latin American pitchers thing, and I was like, holy cow, all these names come out to me. They all stand out. And then and then, and then then uh, Bob Gibson, and I was like, I, I, I remember when he was in Flipper. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, yeah. this is just—it's just crazy right. to me how much, how much all these legends. Even as you name the names, I go, "Oh yeah!" Like it's just crazy, right? I, I mean, it's amazing how you know baseball doesn't have the imprint it did on me as a child. I don't know if it still does. I have a hard time because, and I think you'll understand this maybe, but like I never had a team. Because I grew up in Tampa, right? Because I was grew up in Tampa, we didn't ha- I didn't, we didn't have the Rays, we didn't have the Marlins. There was no teams down here, so the first team I really got into was the Yankees. Because I moved to New York and we go to Yankees games, and that is such it was such a legendary field, right, yeah. the old one. Yeah, it was so oh, insane. The grand old lady. Oh, oh my gosh! But you, I was an Oakland A fan living in Tampa. Really, seventy two, seventy three, seventy four. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. you know, and my. Palmasia senior league team is green and gold. Yeah. So I had oh, nine yeah. <laughs> I had nine for Ted Williams and Reggie Jackson. I wore nine. So you know, and Tampa, Florida, you're an Oakland A fan. I never saw them on TV unless they were on the game of the week. Yeah. You know, you you basically just read about them a little bit in the newspaper. But every time they were on TV, Reggie was going deep or or Vita Blue was, you know, Vita striking Blue. out 17 and and here comes uh, Raleigh into the game, and he's saving it, and and then you got to see him a lot in the postseason. Yeah, I mean that's where I became the fan because they were always in the postseason. Yeah, they were the only team in the you know and and oh well, we back, had the, in, the, back the, in the early days and and like seventy when the Orioles were on TV and all the games were at one o'clock in the afternoon and I mean that was we had the Cubs would would come through to Tampa. Meaning, like the, the the station. I think right. that was probably early TBS. Right, is the Cubs, yep. the Yankees, because Steinbrenner lived in Carrollwood. He had a house in Carrollwood, mm-hmm. and so Steinbrenner, the Yankees, and then I think spring training for the Yankees was over by the Bucks Field. Was over was down here, but the spring training for the Reds was down here too. So you were a Reds fan also. Well, like, that was that was at the complex right over here. What was but that? they had Al Lopez Field. Al Lopez Field, yeah, the Reds. The Reds trained here. The Yankees were in Fort Lauderdale. Oh, the Yankees were in Fort Lauderdale. The Yankees were they Fort moved Lauderdale. here in Fort Lauderdale. Baltimore was in, was in Miami. They moved here in high school, correct? 96. Yeah. Yeah. 96 was uh, the first year that we moved from Fort Lauderdale to here. Really? Yeah. Gosh. So I spent two years of spring training with the Yankees here and then signed with the Rays and spent 98, 99 <laughs> spring training in St. Pete. Oh, that <laughs> that's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you wear baseball hats ever? No, that's crazy. I don't, no. I don't even play this sport, and I wear them not. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love baseball hats. I, I've. I, it's just I wear it to play golf, you yeah. know, or fish or something like that, but not with a team on it or anything along what, those lines. What was retirement like for you? Difficult. Yeah. 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 Extremely difficult because I was healthy. Um, I was probably in the best shape at forty-one that I had ever been in my life. Mm-hmm. I'd figure out my back situation through chiropractor. And so that, and I just had knee surgery, but it, I was ready in nine days Mm -hmm. and they put me on the 60 day DL. Yeah. And when they did that, then the next year I had an option for 2000 and they didn't pick up the option. And then I decided, do I want to go do something else or just right off into the sunset? And it was a, it was a long, tedious process of four to five days of just nothing but looking in the mirror and asking yourself, when you cross the bridge, there's no turning back. 
And a couple of times I got halfway across and I would walk it back a little bit. And then after about the fifth day, I said, are you ready to cross the bridge? And that's when I crossed the bridge, called my agent and said, I'm done. And emotional I bet. because I knew I could still play. I, I just needed a, a place to play. Yeah. And I, I, it's kind of emotional, but I, I didn't want to be one of those guys that hung on to the end and everybody goes, man, he should have retired like two or three years earlier. And so then the Rays offered me the assistant GM job and that's, was terrible. I hated being in the front <laughs> office. And so then I told Chuck Lamar, uh, they just gotten rid of their hitting coach. I said, uh, I said, I'll throw my name in the hat. So I had an interview in spring training in 2001 with Larry Rothschild. I said, or in January, I said, I'd like to be the hitting coach. Well, how can you teach Fred McGriff and, and Vinny Castilla and Greg Vaughn and all these guys how to hit a home runs? I said, very simple. Don't change their swing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's fucking brilliant. And Don't change your swing. No, There's yeah, that's that's so the, many people try to change swings and say you got to do it this way. No. Don't change their swing because if you try to change their swing, they're not going to hit home runs. Yeah. And so it was a difficult job. And then at that time my son was was uh becoming a freshman in high school and I said, "You know what? I think I get more enjoyment out of coaching my son for four years than I would traveling around the United States. Yeah. And that's what I did for the next 21 years, coach high school baseball here in Tampa at Wharton. So Gosh. that was a lot of fun and very rewarding. But the one thing we didn't do is win the state championship. We came close a couple of times, but um, I, I think that that would have been the last little piece of the puzzle that would have, would have sat really well to win a state championship. And, yeah. and, and I mean, it just, you look around Tampa, some, I mean, I, I think, um, I think it was Strawberry Crest just won this year. Yeah. Uh, Strawberry Crest or, um, uh, wasn't Bloomingdale. I think it was Strawberry Crest that just, uh, won the state championship this. No, I'm sorry. It's Sickles. Sickles oh, yeah. won. Really? And yeah. And Jesuits always go into the yeah. state playoffs, but, um, I saw one of those kids last night at the Bucks game. He was like, he came out to our batting practice last year. Epic. I was like, oh, thanks. I was like, I'll be back this year. <laughs> I can't wait to see how I hit on steroids. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, there you go. A lot more homers. A lot more. A lot more homers. Uh, that, uh, that would be nice. I would love that. That seems like a, it seems like perfect, a perfect dismount is to come out of the pros and coach, coach at home would be awesome. Yeah. I still got to put on the <clears throat> uniform. I, you know, I still got to teach baseball and ride the yellow buses around to various schools and all of that good stuff. So oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. The, the retirement thing I'm, I'm trying to figure out cause it's hard with comedy that you don't ever really need to retire because you can always work. They'll always find, you know, you can always do spots. You can always do stand up. And I think we're at a weird part of this this generation is it's the rules have been different, you know? Like even David Spade's not that much older than me. So it's not like it's not like David Spade's 70, even though he's had like easily 20 more successful years than I've had. Like if not 35. I mean, he's been right. like, but he's we're the same roughly the same age. It's just comedy's changed so much. I I was saying to my cow to today, cowhead, I call him cowhead still. I was saying, I was saying to him, uh, I was like, maybe I'll do like a couple more tours and then I'll do like another movie or do a TV show. And then, then maybe I'll just call it quits at 55 and get a boat. And, and he was like, you could never do that. And I can't imagine how difficult walking away from baseball would have been walking away from baseball me for me in real life was tough it, to, to, to walk away from a game to walk away from a game that I played since I was, I mean, since I was the four or five. Sure. St yeah. And that day that I decided to stop playing baseball was a very, very emotional day. And by myself in college at 18 years old, uh, walked off the Florida state field in back to the dorm. Luckily I had marijuana to 
softened my landing. We got high, <laughs> and I and I sat in this room in the high in the dark, and I thought, so I'm done playing baseball. Like I'll never need my baseball glove again. Yeah. Like I'm. It was. It was like little things. Like I. I have like I had all my gear up because I thought I was gonna play, and I just was like, no, I'm done. And I literally said, I think I'm gonna focus on partying, and it worked out. Wow. Right. Oddly enough, it worked. Well, what out. about what about having a residency in Vegas? You ever thought about that that type of? I had a good friend who got offered a residency in Vegas, and I told him, I said, buddy, I think this is the best thing you could ever do. And he died I mean, like you... six months later oh, really? in Vegas. Oh, maybe not the best. Shout thing. out to Ralphie Bay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I I was I, I would I would I would thrive in a residency in vegas i would thrive i would love it i would love it i would love it yeah i would yeah, love I, mean, I, I would i would think anybody at the top of their profession in my opinion it would, it would be a no-brainer because it, yeah. every night you have so many different people coming through the venue and they're coming to vegas just to see you yeah you know i mean you go to you go to Minnesota, you go to Washington or you, you go wherever, various people don't get to see you, but people will fly to Vegas just to see you. Oh, yeah. And I, I think that, that that's one, one of the neatest things is that the people at the height of their industry, if they, yeah, I want, I want a residency of Vegas. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do Wednesday to, Wednesday to Sunday or something like that or, or whatever the days are and anything like this. And, uh, you know, they put you up in the big penthouse and, and all of that good stuff. And, Oh, I already, I've already mapped it out. I have, I have different scenarios that I build out in my life. Like one is me and Tom were to Sugar, we're talking about this. If my wife left me, so I have to find a city where she doesn't want to go. Cause I'd be devastated. I'd be devastated. Right. So like I Key West, uh, New Orleans, she doesn't want to go to Key West. My wife is such a drip that's she, the greatest <laughs> place on the planet it is fucking oh, awesome oh sloppies she, and uncle tony oh and, my god come on. i love key west. key west is the best we, we have fishing tournaments down there all the time and and it's just so laid back and and it, it's terrific it really is god yeah. there, i bet i bet the games do they do they still do like celebrity games and baseball games in florida in tampa they used to do that when I was a kid, or maybe it was a uh, alumni game. Alumni something. games, yeah, alumni yeah. We games. used to have those. Yeah, yeah. They used to do alumni games. <laughs> and <laughs> God, I Bob Feller would still pitch in them. It was yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah I, I played in a few of those after I retired. And, yeah, and Mark Harmon and I won a home Mark? run home run derby before one of the alumni games. Yeah, over in uh, Clearwater. Yeah, at the uh, Phillies Field. Oh, really? Yeah. So Mark Harmon's my partner in the in the thing, and and we went up against Allstott and another actor or something like this, and and I said I said you do know one thing that Allstott cannot beat us. <laughs> I mean, all you know, Mike Allstott when he walks in, he's it's like, ah, uh, oh, he's he's cut like the Hope Diamond, <laughs> and so I'm sitting there going, he they can't beat us, and I just started finding the jet stream. I think yeah. I hit 15 <laughs> and they were just right center, right center and bombs too. And I'm going, damn, I might have to come back and start playing again. Cause I'm, I'm, Oh, the swing's still there. Oh, they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it's, it's been, uh, I, it's one of the things I love the best is we go to these, uh, we do my, during the summers, we do a festival called fully loaded where we play at minor league stadiums. Yeah. And so they'll set up the stage uh, like just past second base We'll hang out as comics in the outfield and like couches. They put up couches for us, but they fill up the infield and, they, and we sell the stadiums out. And inevitably, the teams will show up and you and they're always like, "We heard you're into baseball." I'm like, "Yeah." And they're like, "You want to take batting practice?" I'm like, "You fucking know I do." <laughs> <laughs> and that's like one of my favorite things. That's great. Yeah, one of my favorite things. I mean, you know, I'm curious to because like you came to my Tampa show. My Tampa show was just thick with like all my heroes and i was like this is this is like the payoff and it sounds like that was your getting into the hall of fame of seeing all your heroes and being like shut like who who are you ever shocked that you were like i can't believe you know who i am frank robinson frank robinson yeah wow yeah 
Yeah, I was surprised you knew who I was. Willie Mays didn't know who I was when I was on the bus going to the uh, induction that Sunday morning. <laughs> he told me to get off the bus. Are you serious? Yeah. I'm on the bus in the back, you know, and I'm sitting there and he goes, who are you? And I went, Wade Boggs. He goes, you ain't allowed on this bus. And I went, I'm, I'm going in and uh, it's my induction year. What? No. <laughs> And I went, yeah, it's me. <laughs> you don't need to get off the bus. I went, oh, okay, here we go. And then I think uh, uh, who was behind who was behind him, Bob Gibson or somebody. And uh, and Gibby said, Willie, what are you doing, harassing Boggs? He goes, trying to kick him off the bus. He goes, he's going in today. And they were just going back at each other. And I'm I'm sitting there nervous yeah. anyway. Yeah. And that didn't help. Golly. Yeah, that didn't help. That's fucking. Yeah. Well, th- I got to be honest with you, man. I uh, it, it has been an honor. Well, to, thank you. I, to I appreciate the you. invite. I, I am. I appreciate the invite. I cannot express to you. I, I and, and I, I, I'm only certain that you may have felt this with other people in your, in your life, but like what an important part of baseball you've been to any kid that grew up in Tampa, but and I and I say that exclusively from my experience, but to me independently, I, I like I said to follow you, and then and then to follow right after you to go to New York right after you and move to New York and start my stand up, and then it's just been and without a doubt, my dad was not impressed. I mean, he was impressed. He just isn't a very vocal man. And when I did Emily, he texted me and he said Wade Boggs is here. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, I know. And he goes, do you think he knows who you are? I said, well, he's about to find out. Like, I'm going on stage. I'll definitely introduce myself when I get on stage. And he goes, can you believe this? And I and I wrote back, actually, Dad, I can't believe it. But you're making me a little nervous. <laughs> like, can you? And then to, to for to have you backstage and and my dad there, and it was just, it was like such a like, like there's very few times that you get to feel. I think in this life, like you've made it. And I know that's such a, a shallow phrase, like you've made it, but I'll tell you without a doubt. I, wow. But you made me feel like I made it. Thank you, I, brother. I, I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, thank, thank you. you. And and I'll tell you what, I got to I gotta bring you out. If you ever want to come out to LA, I do a cooking show. I'd love to have you I got out a cookbook for, for you. For real? Yeah. Really? My wife and I wrote a cookbook. It's called Foul Tips. <laughs> F-O-W-L. Yeah, I just got it. <laughs> that's great yeah. well let's do it we'll right. bring out and we'll that'd be fun yeah that'll be a blast that'd be fun hell yeah thank you so much all man. right man my pleasure